Hello, Shelter Rock Church, Pastor Steve here, and I am holding my pet snake, Jamborees. Now, if you listened in on the phone call I had with my wife the other day, when I told her that I have a brand new pet, immediately she's like, what did you buy? And I said, I bought a snake and I named it Jamborees. Now, my wife is pretty sharp. She knew immediately what I was referring to. You might not know this, but when Moses goes before Pharaoh with Aaron, the two magicians that mirror the kind of special effects of creating snakes in Egypt are Janus and Jambres. Now, we actually don't know that from the Exodus passage. What we know it from is 2 Timothy chapter 3, which refers to the encounter. But I'd like to tell you a little bit about the snake. This is a real snake here. The amount of times that I have held a snake in my life I can count on one hand, and always with some kind of professional. So there I am at Petco talking to them about snakes. Now this is a ball python. Even though it's a fairly small snake, what you will find is that this snake will grow to be six feet long. It's a pretty long snake. They said it won't bite you. She told me about how often it sheds. It eats about once a week. I have to feed it mice. Now at this stage, I can feed it a frozen mouse that I thaw out and then dangle before it, making it look like it's alive and Jamborees will munch on it. But later on, when it's six feet, I'm expected to feed it something as big as a rat and it will be a live rat. Now there are just so many things I did not know about snakes. For example, the need to keep it warm. Its optimum temperature is in the upper 80s to need to keep it humid or moist. So I need to spray it down several times a day. And when I touch it, it's actually smooth. It's, it's actually not scary to, to hold it. Although I will admit that when I first got it, the first time I held it, I was a little bit frightened. What I have found is that I have now experienced what it's like to have a snake. I've learned about different kinds of snakes. I've learned how to care for snakes. This is very, very different from head knowledge about snakes that I had previously. Today, as we continue our journey into the book of Exodus on our series, The God Who Rescues, snakes will be a part of our story a very important part, even a metaphor for what is to come. But what is a greater principle that is going to emerge is that God is going to call people, both believers and unbelievers, to experience who he is. Now my hope, my prayer, is that today we, as we participate in this service, might have an encounter, might have an experience with the Lord. With that in mind, would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for your beautiful creations, even like this snake in my hands. I'm grateful that you created such a diverse world where we experience so many interesting forms of life. But what we are looking for now, Father, is that by your Holy Spirit, you will reveal to us more about yourself and that in the end, we will grow to be the men, women, students that are becoming more like your son, Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. So I'm gonna put Jamboree's down back where it's warm and uh, be careful and take good care of my brand new pet. But as we look at our passage, here's what I'd like you to do is if you have a Bible, open it to Exodus chapter seven. Exodus chapter seven. Now, Exodus is the second book in the Bible. We're actually gonna start a few verses beforehand, which is Exodus chapter six, verse 28. But if you aim for chapter seven, you'll be in the right place. And we're going to read from chapter six, verse 28, into 13 verses into chapter seven. And here is what we read. Verse 28 of chapter six. Now when the Lord spoke to Moses in Egypt, he said to him, I am the Lord. 
tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, everything I tell you. But Moses said to the Lord, since I speak with faltering lips, why should Pharaoh listen to me? Then the Lord said to Moses, see, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. You are to say everything I command you, and your brother Aaron is to tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go out of his country. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and though I multiply my signs and wonders in Egypt, he will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt with mighty acts of judgment. I will bring out my divisions and my people, the Israelites. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded them. Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 when they spoke to Pharaoh. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, when Pharaoh says to you, perform a miracle, then say to Aaron, take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh and it will become a snake. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just what the Lord commanded. Aaron threw his staff down in front of Pharaoh and his officials and it became a snake. Pharaoh then summoned the wise men and the sorcerers and the Egyptian magicians also did the same thing by their secret arts. Each one threw down his staff and it became a snake, but Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Yet Pharaoh's heart became hard and he would not listen to them just as the Lord had said. We see this dramatic power encounter taking place between Moses and Aaron and Pharaoh and his magicians. What I'm hoping to see today, though, is that it's all about knowing who God is. If you recall, Pastor Henry taught last week on the previous chapter, chapter 5 and 6, and in chapter 5, verse 2, he said that Pharaoh asked the exact right questions except for the wrong reasons. This is what Pharaoh asked. Who is the Lord? And of course, the Lord is standing for Yahweh. Who is Yahweh that I should listen to him? That is a great question. Who is the Lord that any of us should listen to him? When we move forward into chapter 6, verse 7, we read these words by the Lord. He says this, I will take you as my own people. I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. So Pharaoh says, who is the Lord? And then God says in the very next chapter to his own people, you will know who I am. But then in our passage, chapter 7, verse 5, the Lord says this, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. In either of these cases, whether you are an Israeli or whether you are an Egyptian, you're going to know who the Lord is. Do you know who God is? I mean, do you have a living knowledge of who God is? Now, if you look at the word know in your Bibles in the New Testament, it's the word gnosko in Greek, and it refers to knowledge that you have in your head. But when you look at the word know in the Hebrew scriptures, it is the Hebrew word yada, and it actually speaks of coming to experience something. Let me give you an example. You could ask a single person and you could ask a married person, please tell me what marriage is like. And the single person could probably give you a pretty good description of what marriage is. But the married person is speaking from their experience and that colors their understanding, their knowledge of what marriage is like. In a very similar way, when God says to his people, you will know me, when he says to the Egyptians, you will know me, he's speaking, they will know him by way of experience. But here is the principle that I want you to hear. Everyone, everyone 
is going to know God. Everyone is going to know God. Whether you call yourself a Christian, whether you call yourself a Buddhist, whether you call yourself somebody part of the Shinto religion, whether you're a Muslim, you will get to know God. And the question is, are you going to get to know him in his compassion and his mercy? Or are you going to experience him in his judgment? Now Moses gives us the first sense of what it's like to discover, to experience what God is like. When we come into our passage, we find that Moses is struggling with this assignment once again. I mean, in Exodus chapter four, over and over he keeps saying, I can't do this, I can't do this. And finally he says, choose someone else. But here we are, several chapters later, and in verse 30 of chapter six, Moses said to the Lord, since I speak with a faltering tongue, why would Pharaoh listen to me? So God is going to teach him. He's going to get to know God. The first thing I see in chapter seven, verse one is this. God says, see, I have made you like God to Pharaoh. What Moses discovers is that God equips. Here's a man with faltering lips. He, he can't speak, he, he's nervous, he's, he's anxious. We move down to verse six. Here's a man who's 80 years old and his companion is 83. But it doesn't matter to God. And what Moses discovers as he encounters, as he experiences God, is God is going to equip him for everything he needs. That is an experience of who Yahweh is. I move to verse two and I read this. God says, you are to say everything I command you. God instructs. He tells Moses what he is to say. So his experience of God is a God who informs him of everything that is necessary to move forward. I move down to verse four and I read this. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt with my mighty acts of judgment. I will bring out my divisions, my people, the Israelites, and I find out in my experience that God delivers. That's a big instruction that Moses received. And I can pull one more from this text. When the stakes are thrown down by, by Aaron and then ultimately by the Egyptian magicians, Janus and Jambres, that Aaron's snake eats the other snakes. And I find out that Yahweh is ultimately victorious. Which brings me back to the question, do you know God on an experiential level? Many of you call yourself a Christian. Probably most people watching this video, listening to my voice, will call yourself a Christian. You may regularly attend church. You may regularly pray, read your Bible. Some may even share their faith. But do you know God experientially? Can you tell a story of your encounters with the living God. This past week, Pastor Henry invited somebody to speak to the staff. It was a very special Tuesday morning, and we had with us Andre Mubarak. Now, Pastor Henry got to meet this man when Shelter Rock Church went to Israel about a year ago. And on this trip, this was their guide. He's Palestinian, but he's a Christian Palestinian. So he is in a very small minority. Most people in Israel are either Jewish or Muslim. And of the Arab community, overwhelmingly, they're Muslim. But here he is, Arab background, Palestinian background, but he's a Christian. He grew up on the Via Della Rosa, the way of suffering. So that's where he played soccer as a kid. And tourists would come by and they'd say, hey, can you show us the next stop on the, on the Via Della Rosa? And he would just point to it. He said his Christianity, though, was about forms and, and religious actions and, and duties. But when he was at the University of Bethlehem, he saw this table in the lunchroom filled with joyous people, happy people. And he wanted to ask them, why do you have this joy? And they said, well, we know Jesus. We've discovered him to be our Messiah. We've become born again. And he wanted more of this. And he makes the cognitive choice that he is going to give his heart 
to Jesus Christ, receive the forgiveness that's offered from him, he begins a new journey. Well, Israel has been a violent place in, in many times and, and environments, and there was an antifa going on, antifada, in which there was a, it just means uprising of the Palestinian people, and there were various bombings taking place around the country. Tourists were staying away, and really only the locals were around. Well, he's in a populated area, and it's quite crowded, and he feels like he hears a voice from God saying, move out of the way. And he thinks, what is this? I mean, what do you do if you feel like you hear a voice from God? Probably most of us would think it's rather strange. It must be what I ate last night for dinner. But then he feels himself being pushed, and he thought it was the friend who was with him. And after he's gone some distance, he turns, and there's no one by him. And suddenly, a bomb goes off. And where he was, was where the bomb went off. He would have been one of the casualties, and a number of people died. Now, if you have a bomb go off near where you are, what is your natural instinct? It would be to run. And that was his natural instinct, except now he hears again the sense of the voice of God inside of him saying, stay where you are. This time he listened. And as everyone around him started running away from the explosion, another explosion happens exactly where all those people were running to, where he would have been running to. But he was safe because he stood still. He has told this story time and time again. Pastor Henry himself said he heard it three times. And why does he tell it? Because it is an experience with God. It will be his story probably for the rest of his life that becoming a Christian for him was not purely a cognitive experience assenting to a particular set of beliefs, but it was an encounter with the Lord. Have you had an encounter with the Lord? It may not consist of being saved from a bomb explosion, but it very well could consist of you having a story of healing having a story of somebody reaching out to you, having a story of restoration in a relationship where you felt the presence of God palpable. And now it is part of your journey because this is all about this passage. God's people knowing who Yahweh is and the Egyptians knowing. The question again is will you know it in terms of God's mercy and grace or will you know it in terms of God's judgment? So I mentioned some examples how, how Moses is getting to know God. But now we move to the Egyptians, or more specifically, Pharaoh. And I want to talk about the snakes for one moment. We are introduced to these snakes, and, and some of us find this an odd miracle in the sense that it's pretty impressive that Aaron's staff becomes a snake, but when the magicians duplicate it, it kind of takes a bit of the wonder away, even though Aaron's snake devoured the other snakes. But there's more going on here than meets the eye. The first time we are introduced to snakes in Exodus is chapter 4, when God is basically talking Moses into being his spokesman. And he says, Moses, put your hand in your garment, take it out, it's leprous, put your hand back in, now it's clean. Moses, throw your staff down, it becomes a snake, now pick it up by the tail, it becomes a staff. What is intriguing is that word for snake in Hebrew is nakish, which is a different word for snake in our text. That first word actually is a word that sounds like to the Hebrew speaker, like the hiss of a snake. And so the word is similar to that. But the word used in chapter 7 is tannin. And what stands out about this word is when it shows up in other places of Scripture, it refers to this great sea creature. For example, in Job, it's referred to as Leviathan. Same thing in, when you see it show up in Isaiah. It's speaking of this monster. And what you sense, we still believe these are actual snakes that are in our story in chapter 7. 
but it is speaking of a power encounter between Yahweh and the gods of Egypt. So this Tannen, this Leviathan, they are now coming together. And what happens is Aaron's Leviathan, Aaron's snake, devours the other two. And it becomes a metaphor for what God is going to do in judgment to the Egyptians. Now, over the next weeks, as we continue our journey through Exodus, we're not going to spend a lot of time on the plague, so I'm going to touch upon them right now. You may or may not know this, but each of the plagues that Moses performs through God ultimately is crushing another Egyptian god. Let me run down them, and we'll just say this very, very quickly. Uh, I'll show this on the screen also. First of all, of the ten plagues, first one is water turned to blood. This is a direct attack on Hapi. Then frogs coming out of the Nile. This is a direct attack on the god Heket. Then lice from the earth's dust. This is a direct attack on the god Geb. Swarms of flies. This is Kefri. Death of cattle and livestock. This is attack on Hathor. Ashes turned to boils and swords. This is an attack on Isis. Hail from the former fire from the attack on the god Newt. Locusts sent from the sky, attack on the god Seth. And then three days of complete darkness, the top of the Egyptian pantheon, an attack on Ra, the sun god. But finally, Pharaoh was considered a god, and he loses his son, his firstborn son. It's an attack on Pharaoh as god. And ultimately, what we find is Yahweh is even going to swallow up the Egyptian army in the Red Sea. One snake devouring the other snakes becomes the metaphor of getting to know God, that this is not a God. Yahweh is God. Which comes back to the question, do you know him? Do you know him? experientially. The Apostle Paul says something I find interesting in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, and he speaks of being in Corinth, living with them, experiencing life with them, and he says this, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. The Apostle Paul's desire was the knowledge of God in Christ. He did not want that knowledge, this very learned man, purely through intellectual pursuit, but by breaking bread and living with the Corinthian church. I resolved nothing while I was with you except to know Jesus Christ. You see, we get to know our Lord as we experience life together. Do you know him? This week, I went jogging as I usually do. And I often listen to music, but I felt inclined to listen to a preacher. A preacher many of you have probably heard of, very famous in the New York area, Tim Keller. Now, I've listened to Tim Keller many times, but I haven't listened to him recently. And I haven't listened to him since his diagnosis with fourth stage pancreatic cancer. And so as I was listening to Tim Keller, he was unfolding the book of Jonah, particularly the first chapter. Now, do you remember Jonah the prophet? He was instructed by God to go to the capital of Nineveh and tell them God is coming in judgment. Now, Jonah wanted nothing to do with the Assyrians. He hated them. They were the most evil people on the face of the earth as far as he was concerned. So he takes a boat to go to one of the furthest places on the map in those days, Tarshish, which would be on the coast of Spain. But while they're in the middle of the sea, a storm comes up, and these sailors, all of them from various different religions, and sailors are not known as the most pious people, but when you're in the midst of the storm, everyone is crying out to their own God. And the storm's not abating. And so they look and they find Jonah and they say, appeal to your God. And Jonah says, I, I know why the storm's here. 
It's here because I'm running away from the Lord, the creator of heaven and earth. And he says, if you throw me into the water, the storm will cease and there'll be peace. Well, after a bit of a dialogue, they eventually throw him into the water and everything's calm. And these pagan worshipers, they now become worshipers of the Lord because they experienced God and his power. Tim Keller said 18 months ago, I was looking forward to retirement. There's gonna be a new season in life. I'm gonna do an occasional guest lectureship. I'll, I'll preach various places. I'll write books. Life is good. But then came his diagnosis, pancreatic cancer, fourth stage. He says, my future is very much in doubt. I don't know what is in store. And while I've been going through this, he said, I, I, using another metaphor, this one from Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Remember the end of the Sermon on the Mount, chapter seven of Matthew, Jesus says there were two people, one who built his house on the rock and another built his house on the sand. And Tim Keller said, I've been assuming all this time my house is built on the rock. But when this diagnosis came, I came to realize that a good portion of my house was built on the sand because I was going through all this tension, all this fear, and I realized I'm not much different than those pagans on the boat crying out to their gods. He said, what are our gods today? Sexuality, uh, materialism, resources, money, travel, all these things that we find our comfort in, but when we are in the storm, we realize all these things are inadequate until we come back and experience Yahweh. Which brings me back to the same question. Have you experienced the Lord? You will all experience, Paul says in Philippians chapter two, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. It's not an if, it will happen, but Will you experience him in his mercy and grace and the knowledge of that, the wonder of that? Or will you experience in his judgment? Are you gonna be like the Egyptians and hold on to your little gods and find them completely inadequate to the task? Or are you going to be like the Israelites who discover that Yahweh is who he says he is, that he will carry you through the storm and bring us to a place of wholeness and restoration. God is still in the business of making himself known. In fact, Jesus says in John chapter 12, if I am lifted up, if I am made known, I will draw all humanity to me. And when he was lifted up on the cross, that is the appeal to know him in his grace and mercy so we do not have to know him in his justice and might. Today, as we continue our journey through Exodus, it is a call to experience the Lord, to know him and discover that he's still welcoming people into his loving arms. Friends, it's been great being with you. I pray God's blessing upon you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these few moments to spend with my friends and by your spirit, wherever they are, wherever they're listening, I pray you would give them an encounter with yourself that will be glorious and memorable and help them to receive the wonder of the knowledge of who you are. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.